Amy, AORN, Joint Commission, DNV, HSPA, they all unanimously agree. Hey, sterile processing professionals, Brandon the Sterile Guy here. And in today's video, it is myth busting number five. I know, I know it's been a while. There's always so much to work on. I sometimes forget to come back to this baseline video talking about the stuff that people believe that is just incorrect. But if you like proving people wrong, then hit that like and subscribe button. That'll show them. Let's jump right into our first myth. Myth number one, internal integrators or indicators need to be in the center of every tray. Now, a lot of technicians know that integrators or indicators need to be in the most difficult places of a tray to reach for the sterilant. But a lot of technicians also believe somehow there has to be one in the dead center of the tray. Now this myth is tricky because the way it's stated is factually wrong. Not every tray is under this guideline, but there is an instance where this does matter. Can you guess what the context of that is in which a indicator in the exact center of a tray truly matters? Think about it this way. Indicators are meant to challenge the penetration and effectiveness of the sterilant. So the sterilant first has to reach that place and then it has to kill the bugs that are in that place. Now, if you think about just a simple tray, like a simple minor tray, one level, just basic instrumentation, where in that tray is the most difficult place for sterilant to reach. Now, it's really difficult to answer if you don't know the packaging, right? The packaging is what determines if an indicator must be in the dead center of the tray. The exact center of a tray is what's known as called the geometric center. If you think about a metal container, right? So you have, usually if it's a long tray, you have two different filter tops and then two different filter bottoms, right? So the steam can penetrate through both all four of those spots. Now, where in there is the most difficult place for the steam to get? Well, not the center because that's kind of where it comes in. In a metal tray, the most difficult place is the opposite corners. That's the most difficult place for steam to penetrate. But if you think about a wrapped tray, the steam can penetrate from all angles. The wrap is completely permeable to sterilin. So the only place that is mathematically the equal distance challenge from every other place in the tray is the geometric center. That's the only place that's the hardest to get to. So does every tray need an indicator in the direct middle of the tray? No, only wrap trays. Myth number two, it doesn't matter where you check the temperature on a tray when it's cooling. Big, fat, false. When trays are cooling, it is different depending on where you point that infrared thermometer on the package because it's gonna show different levels of temperature. As trays are cooling, the vapor that is inside continues to escape until that tray reaches room temperature. This is the reason we don't touch trays because when you touch trays, you allow that vapor to condensate where you touch and then it becomes a strike through. The vapor is the hottest part of the sterilization load. So where the vapor is escaping is where the hottest point of the tray is. So where does the steam escape on trays? Well, if it's a metal container, it's escaping where the filters are. So you're going to test where the filters are. On a wrap tray, it's gonna take the easiest exit possible, which is gonna be through the folds. So you wanna point that infrared thermometer at the opening of the folds because that's gonna be the hottest point of the tray. And lastly, with peel packs, it can escape through the plastic side, so you gotta test the paper side. Myth number three, trays going into the steam sterilizer do not have to be completely dry. False, I know you've heard it before, it's just steam. Steam is water, water will evaporate off in the cycle. Though that may be true in some circumstances, it significantly increases your chances for a wet load. You see, steam sterilizers use 97% dry saturated steam. So what does that mean? Well, the calculation works like this. Let's say that inside a steam sterilizer chamber, you have 100 pounds of steam sterilant. Now, if that steam sterilant is 97% saturated, 
that means that 97 pounds of that sterilant is vapor. And then three pounds is liquid water. 97% is like the least you want to have as far as water vapor. It would be nice if it was closer to 100, but 97% works good. Now, the more water you add, the more you throw off that balance. Now, at 97%, a steam sterilizer can effectively take that remaining three pounds of water with the heat and everything else and get it to evaporate off. But the more and more you add to that, the less effective the sterilizer can do that. So dry your items before you put them in the sterilizers. Myth number four, if an item is gonna undergo IUSS, you can just hand wash it. I'm not the only one that nurses argue with when it comes to putting the instruments in the washer, regardless of the fact that it's gonna be IUSS. Amy, AORN, Joint Commission, DNV, HSPA, they all unanimously agree on this topic. If the IFU dictates mechanical cleaning is part of the process, nothing overrides it. Remember, you can verify that a procedure works according to what the manufacturer stated, but you cannot change that because now you're stepping into the area of a validator and you are not a validator. A manufacturer and their third-party research is a validator. You are a verification source. Sorry, nurses, buy more equipment and tell Butterfinger Surgical Tech to stop dropping shit. And lastly, myth number five, you must have special cleaning procedures for higher risk diseases like AIDS, hepatitis C, C. diff, and more. I see this asked a lot, especially like on the Facebook groups is, we just got a cart back that the nurse said had C. diff. What special precautions do we need to take? And a lot of times you'll get a tech or you'll get a nurse that calls down and says, hey, just so you know, this patient had hepatitis C. I just wanna make sure you're aware. So what changes in an instance like this when say you get a case from a patient that has AIDS? Well, hopefully nothing. If you're changing practices because you now know this specific patient has a higher risk disease, then I'm questioning all your other practices. You should always be doing two things. Number one, wearing the appropriate PPE to protect yourself. And number two, following the cleaning and disinfection and sterilization standards of the instrument IFU. There's only one exception when this would change and that is CJD. And you know what that process looks like? It looks like taking all those instruments and dropping them in the trash. You cannot, with your standard processes, tackle a instrument that has CJD. You just can't do it. And if you even try, you're going to con cross contaminate other things and spread that disease beyond where it started. If you even try to clean that in a sink, now you've let CJD be in the sink. So when you clean other instruments, now it's probably gonna be on those too. You can't do it, don't attempt it. If they've gone as far as to use reusable instrumentation or drills on a CJD case, I'm sorry, you're writing off a lot of money. You will destroy those instruments trying to destroy the CJD. Most facilities and operations use disposable instrumentation. And then as a matter of fact, most surgeons won't even do surgery on a CJD patient because it's such a fatal terminal disease. Surgery's not gonna do anything. But for everything else other than CJD, normal, non-high risk diseases, high risk diseases, you should be using standard precautions and you should be following the IFUs, which never say anything about a specific disease. They only talk about specific cleaning and sterilization, period. Five more myths busted to make you more knowledgeable so that you are an effective sterile processing technician. Always keep up the great work, my friends. Any topics or videos you wanna see, don't hesitate to put those in the comments down below. Like and subscribe. I love you guys, and I'll catch you in the next video.